I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land upon which we are gathered is Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. These lands are covered under the treaties of friendship and peace, which the Mi'kmaq and Malasi people signed with the British Crown in 1725. Good evening, everyone. My name is Henry Annan, and I'm a proud SMU alum, class of 2014, Go Huskies. And I'm a second-year pediatrics resident training to become a pediatrician, and I work just down the street at the IWK Health Center. And I've got to tell you that despite the long hours on call and the grief that often comes with taking care of a critically ill child, I love my job. There's just something about the minds and resilience of children that shines the brightest light even in your darkest days, and remains my motivation each morning I wake up to go to work. I consider myself privileged to be part of such a rewarding profession, and so naturally, when I get medical students and soon-to-be medical students who express an interest in a career in pediatrics, and they come to me for advice, which I encourage, by the way, I give them my totally unbiased opinion about how pediatrics is the absolute best specialty in the entire world. Now, I wanted to share with you one of these conversations I had with a good friend of mine not too long ago. He was also a medical student and had expressed interest in pediatrics. He'd done a few rotations in medical school and thought he could do some really good work in the field. But he had one reservation. He told me, "Henry, you know, I love pediatrics and everything, but I just heard that a lot of the stuff that you guys do as pediatricians." Are not really medicine-related. Oh, I asked him to elaborate further. Well, I just heard it's a lot of social issues that you can't really fix as a doctor. I see. Tell me more. Well, I don't know. I just feel like it'd be frustrating after spending all these years in medical school. I kind of would like to do things that I was trained to do. Sentiments like this are not uncommon in medicine. In fact, they're not unique to pediatrics at all. Perhaps now more than ever, physicians are being confronted with the social issues that their patients are facing each day. These are the famous social determinants of health. Those characteristics or factors that are not by a medical per se. But are just as critical, if not more critical, in determining health outcomes in patients and patient populations. For example, keeping it to pediatrics, which is the field that I know best, we know from a famous study that was published in the late 1990s that children who experience adverse events such as neglect, abuse, and trauma during their childhood can go on to develop the very biomedical phenomena of cancer. Lung disease and heart disease in adulthood. We know that individuals that complete college and university have higher life expectancies compared to individuals that have not completed high school. And finally, we know that socio-economic status remains one of the most potent predictors of health outcomes in children and in adults. So you see, the social determinants of health are medicine, and they should concern anyone. Who has the privilege and responsibility of providing care to patients? Yet physicians absolutely balk at the idea of having to deal with the social issues that their patients face, citing that they represent challenges that are far too complicated, far too great to take on. Which I find quite ironic, because as doctors we get trained to do some pretty complicated stuff. I mean. When I'm on call in the pediatric intensive care unit, like I was on the other day, I'm often taking care of children whose hearts have stopped beating and so are connected via tubes to a machine that functions as their heart, pumping blood throughout their bodies, perfusing their organs, until hopefully one day their hearts will beat again. We see teenagers come in after severe motor vehicle accidents. Complete with multiple broken bones, multi-organ lacerations, and severe spinal injuries, yet an interdisciplinary team of doctors, surgeons, nurses, and respiratory therapists gather in the trauma bay of an emergency department, working systematically to ensure that that child 
that teenager has the best chance of going back to their baseline as humanly possible. We spend millions upon millions upon millions of dollars in failed experiment after failed experiment after failed experiment, as we should, trying to discover novel therapies to complicated cancers because we collectively believe in our duty to find a cure for this lethal disease. Surgeons spend six, 12, 18, sometimes even more hours in operating rooms, diligently, meticulously excising tumors from parts of the body where the difference between life and death can be a single millimeter. But yet you ask the average physician how they're going to solve climate change, which, by the way, the World Health Organization and basically everyone agrees is the greatest threat to global health in the 21st century. And you'd be lucky if you got as much as a chuckle. Why, why is this? As I pondered this question further, I realized that the answer lied right in that conversation that I had with my friend. He said, after all these years of medical school, I would like to do things that I was trained to do. That was exactly it. Physicians are not trained to deal with the social issues that are impacting the daily lives of their patients. Listen, if you gave me a newborn who's not breathing, as scary as it is, I know exactly what to do because I have trained in that scenario in my residency education over and over and over again so that when it happens for real, my thinking is automatic. Yet if you asked me how I was going to solve the systemic racism that has led to health inequities between minority populations compared to non-minorities, I would have to draw on knowledge and skills acquired outside of my formal medical education. In my sleep, I can rhyme off the diagnostic criteria for rare pediatric rheumatologic diseases like Hinoxon Lyme purpura and juvenile idiopathic arthritis. That's because I studied them in medical school. Yet I received no such lectures on how to provide primary health care to the five million Canadians who do not have access to a family doctor. Now, this is by no means a knock on the Canadian medical education system. I think that Canada should be proud of the physician that she produces who go on to serve their patients and their communities. However, I argue that the good doctor should be able to take care of the entirety of factors that are affecting their patient's health. The good doctor should be just as proficient as knowing which antibiotic to prescribe for their patient's pneumonia as they are prescribing a fix for their patient's low income status, which will determine whether they can afford said antibiotic or not. I argue that the good surgeon is just as proficient as using their scalpel as they are as using their pen, writing letters on behalf of their patients to provincial, federal, municipal policymakers, advancing healthy, progressive public policy. And for those who say that what I'm describing is absolutely beyond the scope of medical practice, that top quality pedagogy and the social determinants of health would be at the expense of producing doctors that are top quality in their clinical acumen, which is what has come to define what a physician is. I point to the many, many physicians across the country who are using their platforms to advance and address the greatest social challenges of our time. Physicians like Dr. Gigi Osler, an ENT surgeon in Manitoba, who also had the distinction of being the first female surgeon to become president of the Canadian Medical Association, and uses her platform to advance the causes of gender equity and diversity in medicine and beyond. Physicians like Dr. Danielle Martin, who published convincing evidence in support of a universal pharmacare system that would ensure that all Canadians have access to their prescription medications. Dr. Monica Dutt is a public health physician in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, and she champions health policies that are rooted in our collective belief that access to top quality health care should not depend on where you live or how much money you have. University of British Columbia's Center of Excellence in Indigenous Health is headed by Canada's first female indig indigenous surgeon, Dr. Nadine Caron, 
who spent time looking for answers and solutions to address the health inequities faced by Canada's indigenous and non-indigenous peoples compared to non-indigenous populations. Doctors like Dr. Courtney Howard of Yellowknife, who travels the world highlighting the deleterious effects that climate change is having on our health. And medical trainees like Dr. Finola Hackett of Alberta and Dr. Claudel Petrin de Rosier of Quebec, who are joining an international effort to ensure that climate change and health educational objectives are included in undergraduate medical education curricula in Canada and across the world. Medical schools stress the importance of a holistic approach to healthcare delivery. A holistic approach to healthcare delivery includes dealing with the biomedical and the social issues that are impacting patients' lives. Climate change, increasing economic disparities, increasing racial tensions, these are things that are not going to solve themselves on their own. It is time for physicians near and wide to roll up their sleeves and join the efforts to create healthier communities and for medical schools in this country to step up to the challenge of ensuring that our future generation of doctors are ready to take on the social challenges that they're going to be confronted with that are impacting the lives of their patients. Because Lord knows, looking at the challenges facing us and the hurdles that are before us, we're going to need everyone. We're going to need the young, the old, and the in-between. We're going to need men, women, and those who do not otherwise identify. We're going to need some passionate act activists and some thoughtful advocates. We'll need some curious students and some dedicated teachers. We're going to need some innovative engineers and some expert scientists. And yes, we're going to need all of their good doctors too to ensure that when I look in the eyes of that five-year-old patient and I tell her that everything is going to be okay, that I can truly mean that everything will be okay, and that she will realize the future that she so deserves. Thank you so much. Merci.